Good afternoon, guys. Thanks for staying around. Um, I kind of have to chuckle in general, as I think our subspecialists here refer to the hand surgeons as being hand weenies, and for some reason, we always seem to go to the bottom of the uh, schedule. As the bone gets smaller, we seem to go last. But with that said, I also have to say that when I was given this task, I thought that if it was a big topic to do in 20 minutes, and I'm realizing these guys have a lot more to talk about. So we're going to talk about wrist fractures and scaphoid fractures. Um, as far back as 200 years ago, uh, Dr. Collies uh, described the eponymous uh, fracture, the Collies fracture that you guys know. It's obviously it's called the distal radial fracture, but he made a comment that for the most part, these do pretty well without any type of treatment at all. And really the question is, is that correct or not? So we'll try to go through that as we talk about the injury. From an epidemiology standpoint, in general, taking out the kids, uh, which uh, is not today's talk, which do make a, a good portion of these injuries, the elderly make a good portion of the uh, injury also, secondary to the osteoporosis, osteopenia, uh, and these low energy injuries. The younger adults kind of fill in the middle part. Um, they have a lower incidence, but they do have a, have a tendency to have more profound effects on their ability to get back to activities because in general, they have, they have a tendency to be worse injuries or come from more high energy type of injuries such as crash, motor vehicle crashes, sports, or specifically falls from a height. Just looking from a cost standpoint, most likely pulled out of Medicare just for treatment, uh, for payment rather, $240 million uh, for the elderly, and the kiddos for some reason have even a bigger number there. Uh, once again, with regards to the younger patients, the middle-aged people, or the younger kids riding motorcycles, difficult to really hash out their economic costs, uh, mostly just because we, just, we don't have that data. But this is a real, real, real injury. Uh, Michael and the other guys have uh, already filled in, for the most part, what we look at from the standpoint of the function of the wrist and hand. We obviously all think about flexion and extension, and of course that's important. But Dr. Black had uh, said about the elbow with regards to pronation and supination, that rotation at the wrist actually is a com combination at the elbow as well as at the wrist itself. And in fact, a lot of the disability that happens with these patients after distal radial fractures happens because of incongruency of what's called the distal radial ulnar joint that we'll talk about. So once again, Michael did a very nice job with the anatomy here, but we're talking today about the distal end of the, of the radius and the ulna. And as you can see, as they articulate at the bottom there, that's where your rotation and pronation and supination comes. So let's think about that as we go forward with regards to how do these patients do after, uh, after injury and after treatment. With regards to the carpal injuries, um, we all remember that mnemonic from, for the eight bones that uh, Michael was talking about, the carpal bones of some levers, tri positions they can't handle. And for the most part, the important one, the S there, is the scaphoid. So let's just think about that. And as Michael pointed out very nicely in his talk, the reason why this one is injured more often is it happens to be the longer of the, of the bones and it has a, also a tendency to be across both carpal rows. So we'll talk about that in depth. From a mechanistic standpoint, how do these happen? Um, invariably, it's a fall on an outstretched hand. The FUSH uh, acronym there is obviously uh, something you guys have heard. The ER, that's the first thing the ER tells us. Um, in this trauma center here, it oftentimes is a fall on outstretched hand, but there, because of our trauma center with motor vehicle crashes, oftentimes it is a result of a motor vehicle crash. But essentially, anything that extends the wrist forcibly can fracture your distal radius. I try to, I think most of us try to group these into two groups, is essentially the low energy injuries. Um, we have our osteopenic uh, little lady here who from a small, uh, low energy kinetic energy will fall from a standing position and fractures her wrist. The reason why this is important, as much as they can be bad, is that the low energy injuries have a tendency in general just to involve the, uh, what's called metaphyseal diaphyseal junction, which is down here away from the joint surface. The implication there is that as much as they can be pretty ugly and oftentimes do need surgical intervention, that the joint surface is not involved. Therefore, we don't have to worry so much about arthritis later on. High energy is just a higher kinetic injury. Um, this is your typical injury, fall from a height. Um, bicycles, motorcycles, car crashes. But high energy, just more kinetic energy, will oftentimes result in a more displaced fracture and more specifically involvement of the joint surface. So once again, here the joint surface is here on this x-ray here from a lateral view, you can see that the joint surface is split into two pieces. The implications of this is that if these patients uh, are younger and they go on to have osteoarthritis of the wrist, they may or may not have symptoms. So we're a little more aggressive with regards to how we treat these. From an initial evaluation standpoint in your office or certainly in the ED, we look for initial def uh, for gross deformity. Uh, these are typical silver fork deformity. They're obviously not always this bad. They sometimes come in quite swollen, and despite being quite displaced, they uh, just look swollen. So they don't have to have an obvious deformity. I'm crepitus, you can elicit. You're not necessarily trying to elicit crepitus, but they can come in kind of crunchy as you're examining them. 
And as an orthopedist, uh, I'm sure you guys heard yesterday, with regards to skin integrity, there are actually very few things that will get me out of bed these at these point at nighttime when the ED calls, but open injuries or compound fractures are important. They're less common in the wrist with regards to distal radial fractures. They have a tendency to happen more often with our individuals who are older, who their soft tissue envelope is a little less uh, robust. But if there's any type of skin penetration, we're not talking about an abrasion, that happens all the time. We're talking about true skin penetration, or it doesn't have to be a big, ugly tibia fracture for us to consider this an open fracture. So we look for skin integrity, and then we look for point tenderness. What I have my thumb in here is, if you remember from anatomy, the anatomic snuff box is on the radial aspect of the wrist, and it's important for this, uh, for this talk here because the scaphoid lives right there. And if the patient has a mechanism consistent with a possible scaphoid injury, and we'll talk about that more, we utilize our fingers, obviously, for palpation. And if they hurt right in the snuff box, we have to think about scaphoid injuries. I ask you, um, for you guys in the office, if you do see these, it's unusual without a gross deformity, uh, but you, we do want to assess their sensation. Obviously, as orthopedists, we like to think that we check everything, but we don't, we don't always. Um, but with regards to bad wrist fractures or wrist fractures overall, we do, we do want to ask the patient, do you have any numbness in your fingers? Do you have any uh, paresthesias? And it's important, uh, because just like with the lower extremities or the forearm, where you can have a muscular compartment syndrome, where the muscle sw swells so much that it starts choking off the blood supply, you can have the same thing in the median nerve in the carpal tunnel. Michael showed you his um, cross-sectional views of the, of the carpal tunnel. The distal radius and the carpus are right there. They actually make up the border or one of the walls of the carpal tunnel. So it doesn't take a lot to think that with a deformity such as this, but also the blood and edema and hemorrhage in the carpal tunnel, that perhaps the nerve itself can get pinched off. A slight distinction there is a patient that comes in and says, I got some numbness in my wrist after I fell, but it's not getting any worse, and they're, and they're also not particularly in pain. Those are probably just more contusions or stretches of the, of the nerve. It's something that you can still alert the orthopedist or the ED about. But the ones we want to keep an eye on are the ones that are evolving. The ones that just fractured that day, they came to your office, their deformity is pretty bad, and they said it's getting worse, the pain's worse, and my fingers are now completely numb. Those are ones that, that should be urgently referred out to the ED or certainly to the orthopedist because that could result uh, in, in problems. Uh, in general, highest incidence of RSD or CRPS in the upper extremity, at least in the hand and the wrist, is usually a result of median nerve compression, uh, and such as a tight cast, or in this case here, an untended to uh, median nerve compression after an injury. From an imaging standpoint, we've seen plenty of x-rays already. For me, as a, as a wrist surgeon, for the most part, we obviously always do stay, start with plain films, and more often than not, you can kind of get the information you need to be able to figure out, do they need surgery, how much displacement there is, um, what are we going to do, what's the fracture personality. But there's some times where it's helpful to get an advanced study. Um, a lot of my colleagues do get CT scans, and I have no problem with that. In general, I think that most hand surgeons can get the information they need from plain films, at least a good set of plain films. Um, but if you are still wondering, because the x-ray does, just doesn't look right, it, you, know, you can't figure out if it's displaced enough or there's joint involvement enough, a CT scan can be very helpful. So this gentleman here, I don't have his plain films up here, did have a fracture that not, really did not look very bad at all. It just looked a little, little funny. So I got a CT scan here, and you can see where on this lateral view here, the carpal bone, which is the lunate, which is right above it, is carried on this very small pedestal of bone, it's called the lunate facet. And you can see how there's significant involvement. And in fact, what's happening here is the carpus is actually sliding with that small fragment of bone off the main fragments of bone. And today's um, uh, software is so good. The 3D CT scans, I mean, we used to, 20 years ago when I started practice, we'd have to kind of rearrange these films in our heads. Sometimes we'd get some reformats. But for the most part, it's so idiot proof at this point. The, the 3D CT scan lets you rotate it around and figure out where the fragments are. So CT scan can be very helpful. For me, it's mostly to uh, alleviate my concerns that there's something that may force me towards surgical intervention, and also from a standpoint of uh, surgical planning, because some of these are very complex and oftentimes need different types of plate systems to fix them. When are MRI scans appropriate? This is something you guys uh, can think about. MRI scans, um, you can have an occult fracture of the distal radius uh, of a colleague's fracture, but they're not that common. The, the common reason why you guys would get an MRI scan, and we'll talk much more in depth about it, is to rule out an occult fracture of the carpus, okay? So in this case here, you can see the uh, bony anatomy is horrible. The CT scan's much better, but, but specifically what you're seeing here is a scaphoid with negative x-rays for a couple of weeks that shows significant edema in the scaphoid. So from a standpoint of ruling out occult fractures of the distal radius, specifically of the carpus, but even of the hand overall, MRI scan is a great study, non-ionizing radiation, just a cost, which I don't really care about, but the reality is if you're still scratching your head a couple weeks later with someone that's really painful still, point tender in the wrist or around the carpus, an MRI scan is diagnostic. How do we treat these initially? 
um, in the ED, um, or certainly if we close, reduce, or reduce these fractures as, as tre initial treatment or definitive treatment, we'll put them into a sugar tongue splint. I had no idea what a sugar tongue splint was until I did this research, but that's what it is. And this is how they usually come out of the ED. When the squad brings them into the ED, they oftentimes have these malleable um, uh, temporary splints, which I think is perfectly fine. But if a patient comes in the office for you guys and they're not grossly deformed but you're still concerned, a good carpal tunnel splint will work also, all right? My only thing that I let you guys know is a lot of the carpal tunnel splints, even that I stock in my office, they're short, and they only come up kind of the distal third of the, of the uh, form. There, I'd rather you not do that, because in general, they kind of hinge at the fracture site. So if you have a beefy enough of, of a uh, forearm splint uh, that you can get on there, that they can get on comfortably on there, that's a perfectly acceptable way to, tra uh, to initially treat it and splint it initially. What needs urgent referral from your office? Gross deformity, I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, an open injury, or you're concerned that it's an open injury. We see abrasions on the palm all the time because that's how they're falling. Those aren't, those aren't open injuries per se, but in all honesty, if you're concerned at all about it, even a little puncture wound, we're not talking about a centimeter, we're talking about two millimeters, especially with an older patient. Their soft tissue envelope is so, small, is so thin that they can come through. Uh, so if you're concerned about that at all, that's either a phone call to, to us as orthopedists or to the ED. And obviously, once again, specifically in your guys' offices, if you're concerned about it, if they're complaining of any numbness or tingling or paresthesias, if they have a deficit, if they're evolving and they're getting worse, that is, that's an urgent referral. And once again, that's something that gets, up, gets us out of bed still at this point. How do we treat this? Okay, well, this is, this is in my, my, my court here. It, it really depends. Dr. Green, my mentor in hand surgery in San Antonio, gave us our first talk as, as fellows, and it was about distal radial fractures, and he said even at age 65 at that point that he still was confused sometimes on how to treat patients, and you have to have a lot of quote-unquote quivers in your arrow. So for the most part, you really do have to le look at each patient individually. Each, each patient, chronologic or non-chronologic, is physiologically different than each patient. The fracture personality may dictate the need for surgery versus not surgeries. Are there associated injuries? At this trauma center here, there are some patients that we have distal radial fractures that probably could be treated non-operatively with a cast or a splint, and oftentimes we will operate on them. They're polytrauma. It helps them uh, facilitate getting up out of bed, uh, start mobilizing themselves with a platform walker versus being stuck in two casts. Associated core morbidities on the other end sometimes will push us the other way. If they're older, if they do truly have anesthetic risk, cardiac risk, diabetes, smokers, whichever, the beautiful, beautiful thing about wrist fractures, in all honesty, is that no one ever died of a bad wrist fracture. So if, they're, if it's a higher risk that they're going to have an anesthetic complication, which is pretty unusual these days, that factors into play also with regards to how we treat this. What are absolute indications? I think I've heard a couple times now I've uh, commented that open injury, okay, that is the, the absolute indication for that is because we have to wash out the fracture. Like any other open fracture, we want to decrease the chance of infection from a standpoint of uh, osteomyelitis. Um, the, the treatment after that depends upon the fracture personality, and we'll talk more about the specific ways that we can treat these surgically. Nerve compromise we also talked about. Nerve compromise sometimes can be treated just with a closed reduction. So if they show up with a really nasty uh, silver fork deformity, the nerve may be pinched and it may be also edematous, but it oftentimes will get better if they actually close reduce the fracture. So, but the absolute indications to do something are the open injuries and the nerve compromise, which leaves us with the really the big, excuse me, the big um, category, which is what are the relative indications? And this is where you really have to think about the patient. In general, the relative indications for it would be for an, a, a younger patient with significant joint involvement, where we're concerned that down the road, 20 years later, 15 years later, that they do develop symptomatic arth post-traumatic arthrosis, that would be an indication for a surgical intervention. Polytrauma, as we said here, with regards to our patients uh, at this trauma center, oftentimes we will intervene and, and operate on these, despite the fact that they could possibly get away with a cast. Need for immediate range of motion, this is something you really have to have an honest discussion with your patient. They're not all concert violin violinists or uh, pianists. Um, they're not all surgeons and not all interventionists that need to use their hands. But if there, is a, if there is the need for using their hand quickly, not just from a standpoint of digital motion, but from a standpoint of their wrist itself, you can make an argument for operating on these patients. What are the treatment options? Non-operative means essentially I'm not taken to the operating room. Casting or splinting a fracture as it lies is very reasonable, okay? So let me, I've, all the pictures I've shown you so far have been show these nasty displaced fractures. They're not all that. In fact, a lot of these are very non-displaced. They're either non-displaced, which means truly a hairline fracture, or they're fractures that are, are angulated just a little bit. That's kind of the art with regards to treating these, is that you have to decide as an orthopedist or as a wrist surgeon, is this fracture stable or not? If they heal in a good position, in a reasonable position, it doesn't have to be perfect to work well. 
In fact, the recent studies have shown that in general, that using, a, using an arbitrary chronologic age of 65, they looked at older patients, that these patients oftentimes were treated either splinting as it lies, healing with a malunion, and despite that, their functional scores did very well. And the reason being is that for the most part, as we get older, all the ligamentous structures that Dr. Baskey showed us, they stretch out, which means that these patients oftentimes do quite well with range of motion and function without discomfort, despite having a really, really crooked wrist. So non-operative treatment is, is still a very, very good option for these patients. If we do operate on them, what are the, what are the arrows in the quiver that we we're talking about? A closed reduction in pinning, okay? So this individual here um, was an extra-articular fracture, which means it did not go into the joint. Her bone stock, despite being pretty old, uh, excuse me, <laughs> about, I think she's about 72 or 73, her bone stock was actually pretty good. So we tried a close reduction. I didn't get her anywhere close. Uh, she was active. She played tennis. So this was a simple operation. This was no cut, no incision. We put her to sleep. We set the bone using fluoroscopy, and I, I shoved three big pins in across the skin. She had good enough bone stock that she, we put her into a splint, uh, or, I'm sorry, a functional orthosis or a removable splint post-op left the, splints, uh, the, the splint on for six weeks, allowing to shower with the splint off, and uh, pulled the pins out in the office, and she did fantastic. So that's one good option, but that's for really pretty simple, what's called extra-articular fractures. Here, um, at our institution here, I would say that the vast majority of patients that do have operative fixation of the distal radius typically have your standard ORIF, okay? Um, starting, I've been in practice for 20 years, about 15, 20 years ago, volar plating, which means on the palmar side of the wrist, the implants became so good and so strong and so low profile that it allowed us to really fix these fractures well, allow you to start early range of motion for hygiene and activities of daily living. And at this point, this is kind of the, the gold standard if you're going to operate and open something is to put what's called a volar plate on. External fixation is still something that we utilize. Uh, the trauma guys may have told you about this yesterday, but if there's a really contaminated, nasty, open injury to the tibia, they may not put a plate or a rod in there to, right to start. And the same thing happens with the wrist. If we have a very high energy injury, bad open injury, big cut, things hanging out, tendons hanging out, oftentimes we'll go ahead and just put an external fixator. And if they did not touch a base on this, the idea here is that you put pins far away from the fracture, and then you put traction in something called ligament ataxis, where essentially you're using the soft tissue to help realign the bones, and then you put a clamp and bars on the outside. This is obviously temporary. They don't, they don't live with this. In general, though, as, as wrist surgeons, we'll usually add some fixation. So I cheated a little bit right here. That first one you saw with the percutaneous pins was actually this lady, uh, and her bone stock was okay, but we actually put the external fixator on also. Sometimes you need a combined approach. Um, sometimes uh, this gentleman was actually done very long time ago, uh, and motor vehicle crash. I plated it on the volar side, and critically looking at it now, it's actually not perfect, but with that said, his bone stock, but also the injury itself, he was still very unstable. So instead of adding a plate on the dorsal side of the wrist, we, we put an external fixator on temporarily to hold things out to length also, okay? So once again, lots of arrows in your quiver. So coming back to Dr. Colley's uh, statement, the question is, what are the results, all right? So when I first was in residency down at Penn, 93 to 98, um, we close reduced these and put X fixes on all the time, and I think that we kind of adhered to Kali's principle that they kind of did all right. And then the literature started coming out, mostly with the advent of volar plating, is that they didn't do well. So, um, so the literature has gone back and forth, and really the question is, are we any better off than we were 20 years ago? And the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes not. So what's best? Okay, so this is kind of a conglomeration of the recent studies that show that, sure enough, that early at three months, okay, the functional scores, which is kind of what we've gotten away from, just, well, what's your range of motion and strength? That's not a good measure of how they do. We put them through a, what's called a DASH score, which is the disabilities of the arm surgery, uh, arm, shoulder, and hand, that doesn't really take into account range of motion. It says, what can you do and what can't you do? And we found that, sure enough, the ORIF, because we let them move their wrist immediately to take for hygiene, take care of themselves and right type and whatever else, is that thir three months later, they do better on the functional scores. But what happens as you go further out? The intermediate results, six months. They're kind of somewhat better. They're not, they're not too much better, though. But what happens at one year, and I think you guys are all smart out there, they're all kind of about the same at a year out. So, you know, what's best? It really depends upon your patient's needs, as we talked about. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears here for a second. This one is important. So the bad distal radius that comes in your guy's office, I think you guys are going to send that out pretty quickly and make the diagnosis pretty quickly. But the carpal injury is important. It's important because actually when it comes to the medical legally, the carpal injury, scaphoid injuries, and ligamentous injuries of the wrist are actually the most litigated um, uh, orthopedic problem 
uh, across the board uh, from head to toe with regards to the ED, but also as orthopedists, specifically for missed scaphoid injuries, all right? So even though there's eight bones, when it comes to the uh, scaphoid, as Michael Baskey says, it's long, okay, it crosses both uh, rows. It has a tendency to fracture in the mid portion of what's called the waist. But when you guys are thinking about injuries, really the top three injuries there, they're always in the scaphoid, and that's what you have to look out for. What's the mechanism? Just like with the Fouche, it's the same thing, okay? Motor I had a kid that had a um, motor vehicle crash, the airbag went off, didn't really hit anything, extended his wrist, he had a scaphoid injury. But for the most part, the wrist has to come backwards to actually uh, break the scaphoid. How do you figure it out? You get an x-ray, okay, we'll look at that in a second here, but the problem with the x-rays is that oftentimes, even though we know there's, or we're suspicious there's a fracture, they won't image well, okay? So coming back to as I've got my thumb in my wife's snuff box right here, that's where you want to push. Now, that, that area, you know, there's a lot of things there. Michael Baskis has talked about uh, CMC arthrosis, but those people don't have mechanism, mechanism of injury that would be consistent with that. So, and we're not talking about a minor sprain of falling into a door. We're talking about feet out, onto your wrist, slip, slip and fall. It doesn't have to be from a height. If they hurt in that area there, you got to rule it out. You got to rule it out, and we do that in our own offices. There's just, we don't have x-ray vision. You have to rule it out. So what do you do? There's the snuff box right there. You get your x-rays, but because of the complexity of the, of just, it's a peanut. I mean, it's a weird looking peanut that's actually not perfectly in either view on the AP or lateral views. They oftentimes are negative, okay? What do we do for that? Well, number one, we all treat them as a presumed fracture, and that's what sometimes they'll come out of the ED. I'm sorry, not sometimes. They'll oftentimes come out of the ED with a splint, and they're like, what are you here for? Well, they think I have a scaphoid fracture. So what we do is we get a repeat set of x-rays, usually in a couple of weeks, okay? If, I, if this hasn't been told to you guys yet, the first uh, step with bone healing is actually bone degradation. So at the fracture site, microscopically, there's hematoma there. All your macrophages and all that come in, and they take away the debris. And so what happens is a fracture that's not evident on the first x-ray of the scaphoid, if you wait long enough, it will show up here. And I think you guys can appreciate the fracture across the scaphoid. Okay. So but what is the initial treatment? Once again, a forearm splint's fine. Forget the sugar tongue. Okay. A cock-up wrist splint, carpal tunnel splint, as long as it's long enough, is perfectly fine. We just want to remind that patient to come back for a repeat examination clinically, pushing their, push their snuff box, okay? If they don't hurt and the x-rays are negative, we're done. You guys are done, okay? If you, have a, if you have a fracture line there, regardless if they hurt or not, then you got your diagnosis and, you, and then you know how to treat it, okay? The problem is what happens if they're still symptomatic with a negative x-ray two or three weeks later, okay? That's where the MRI scan is really helpful, okay? Once again, you can see the bony anatomy is not helpful to me to figure out is this really displaced or not, but it lights up like a Christmas tree with regards to edema. So once again, two to three weeks later, they're still symptomatic. You get a set of plain films. Plain films are still negative. MRI scans, 100% sensitive and specific. It's a great study. No, no radiation either. Why do we want to catch these? Okay, they, because they go on to non-union very often. Okay, so if they're not immobilized, they're not fixed surgically, we'll talk about that in a second, they go on non-union. So here's your scaphoid here. You can see your sclerotic edges of the bone here, and this guy has a scaphoid non-union. And on top of that, he's developing arthritis here on the radial styloid with the bone spur here. Okay. If you guys remember enough back from medical school and rotational orthopedics, why do we have problems with the scaphoid healing? The problem is that the scaphoid and all the carpal bones, they're intraarticular. They're in the wrist. There's no muscle surrounding them. The blood supply is very limited, okay? In fact, the blood supply for the scaphoid percolates off of the radial artery with what's called an axial pedicle, but it's inside the bone, okay? So it comes from the tip, the distal tip, towards the proximal pole, and what happens is as you come with the fracture line delineated by these, these uh, transverse lines here, you go from 100% union rate to down to 27% union rate. So if you don't catch them and don't treat them and don't immobilize them, they're gonna move at that area and the blood supplies never reconstitute and they'll oftentimes end up with a non-union. How do we treat these? You, there's still an excellent argument for um, immobilization, okay? You have a patient that has a fracture at the tip, the distal pole, okay, where it's 100% healing, or at the waist where it's still very good, they're non-displaced. The union rate's 95%. That's still, that's high. That's very good. But the problem is they got to be in a real cast for three to four months. It's problematic, okay? So what do we operate on? Well, the, the, the operative indications for this are displaced, okay? And I think you've seen with the rest of my colleagues talk about the bigger bones. You know, something can be displaced a centimeter, 
or whatever, it, with the scaphoid, because it's so small, if it's off by a millimeter, the contact area is off by 50%. So in general, if we see a display scaphoid fracture, for the most part, we're operating on these. If the fracture is at the proximal pole, where you saw the blood supply starts to peter out, those need to be operated on. And then the relative indication is someone like yourselves or myself that needs to get back to work and actually be able to be out of a cast before four months, we can put a screw across there. To switch back just to general for therapy, the one thing I would ask you guys is if you are gonna manage these non-displaced distal radial fractures, and I have no problem with that, don't let their fingers get stiff, okay? We're constant, we, as orthopedists, sometimes we, we concentrate on the, on the fracture and we forget about other things. I can tell patients all the time, we can treat your fracture well with the wrist, you'll be fine, we have a nice x-ray, and their fingers get stiff because it's natural. The fingers get swollen after surgery, after the injury, they don't wanna move them, they get more edematous, they get lymphedema in there. Sometimes we have to get patients to therapy just for their fingers, even before we start treating the wrist fracture. So from a therapy standpoint, for the most part, early for the digits, if they come back, and you can tell these patients, as Dr. Green used to say, they kind of got a wounded paw look. They, they walk in holding their hands like this. Get them to see an occupational therapist quickly, just for their digital motion. But for the most part, the wrist fracture, the distal radial fracture, the motion starts once the immobilization is discontinued in a splint, usually about six to eight weeks. External fixators, infrequently as we use them, they're on for about six to eight weeks. And the beauty of the ORIF is that once again, because the plate systems are so good these days, it provides a stability that we can have them have a removable a brace made by the therapist and have them doing ADLs within a week. So that therapy, once again, is uh, for the most part, when they're done with the mobilization and for ORIFs, as soon as a week afterwards, okay? So what are the sequelae, what are the complications? Malunion, okay, this is a younger gentleman here. This is 40 degrees backwards, okay? They're supposed to be 10 degrees volarly inclined. And the reality is this was a younger gentleman, and we talked about rotation, the distal radial ulnar joint with, with a malunion like this. This guy was miserable. So we came back later on and did an osteotomy to actually re refracture his bone. Arthrosis, as Michael Baske said, doesn't always have to be symptomatic, okay? In fact, we, we do see patients all the time that come in with idiopathic arthrosis of the wrist that are there for a different reason. The only, uh, the only caveat there is that, once again, if you have a scaphoid nonunion that goes on to what's called a scaphoid nonunion advanced collapse pattern, okay, those patients oftentimes are symptomatic, all right? But as a non weight bearing bone, they oftentimes are not. Nonunion, the distal radius where the bone doesn't heal is unusual with the scaphoid itself, once again, can be fairly common. So final points that I, I'm not telling you guys how to do it because I don't understand this stuff very well, but a distal radial fracture in a perimenopausal, postmenopausal female or, or gentleman um, is by definition a fragility fracture, and if they haven't had a bone scan, they probably need to talk to you guys about that. I would leave the medical management up to you guys with regards to uh, bisphosphonates. Common sense fall prevention with regards to our older patients, with regards to going out and buying cat food and being careful in the winter is important. And just like anything else, in the lower extremity, uh, gravity and activity is important to keep bone stock up. So in conclusion, these are common injuries. Um, they happen at all, all ages. We concentrate on the adults today. They have varied fracture personalities. And once, as Dr. Green said, lots of arrows in your quiver. You don't have to operate on everybody. You should look at each patient individually, look at the whole patient, look, ask them what they do for, for activities, ADLs, and then you can decide how to treat them. And as he said beforehand, once again, lots of arrows in your quiver. With regards to how to treat these patients, not everybody needs an operation. What are our goals? Our goals in general are to get them back to their early, uh, early return of their ADLs. And for the most part, when patients ask me and say, well, will I have, will we normal, perfect, or 100%? And the answer is I say, no, it will not be. And the answer is the goal is to get them functional range of motion, which usually settles out at between six months to a year. Oftentimes, they'll gain 95% of their motion back. You don't need 95% of your motion back to be functional. You really need probably about 60% of your, function, of your uh, uh, motion back, and obviously get their strength back also. Thank you very much. Any questions?